Joe's class today. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yay. Thanks for stopping by in the rainy weather today. A little, little uh, winter coming again tomorrow, right? That's what the weatherman says. I don't think it's going to snow that bad. We'll see. We're going to drop the wall just in case our uh, pansies and primroses don't freeze, but uh, I don't think it's going to get quite that cold. So, so thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to talk everything roses today. Uh, who's new to classes at Sunnyside first time? Nice. Well, Phil, thanks for coming. Uh, we do these pretty much every weekend. If you come all the time, you'll probably get tired of listening to me because I do most of them here, but, but uh, we do have some other speakers as well. So we'll dive right in. Um, everybody's got the information sheet. Yeah, this should be on the chairs there. They'll give you a kind of a little guide as we go through here. I'm going to show you lots of pictures, talk a little bit of products here, and hopefully uh, send you home with some good rose information. So who's got existing roses they're kind of curious about taking care of, okay? And who's looking to add new roses? I always am, so there you go. So we got a little bit of both. So we'll kind of go through here and give you some tips. Can everyone see the screens okay? Yeah. yeah sometimes with the light, it's, we're going to try to figure out some sort of shade cover for it. But, but uh, obviously with the rose, the number one thing is uh, choose a sunny location. We can't grow roses in shade. I think there's a couple I hear on the internet that, oh yeah, you grow that in the shade. Around here with the wet weather, you're going to get nothing but powdery mildew. So I'd make sure you've got at least a little bit of sun. Um, sometimes morning is not the end of the world. If you think of morning sun, if we had, you know, sun from sun up till, you know, early afternoon, that's probably plenty and frankly might dry the foliage off a little quicker in the morning. But always that south exposure, you know, heat of the day. Um, you know, noon to sunset in the summertime is going to give us the best chance of growing roses. Uh, big thing with me, because I could probably raise my hand, who likes to spray? See, nobody likes to spray. <laughs> so if we give good sun and we have good air circulation, we're really going to cut down disease. And that's going to be a big part of the, the discussion today is how to kind of prevent black spot, mildew, different rose issues from coming in the first place. If we have good sun, good air circulation, we prune them the right way, we're probably going to have a little healthier plants without having to do quite as much spraying. Okay, that also means spacing a little bit. If you're like me and we love plants, um, we put too many things in too small of an area. It's going to be worst case with roses. We're not going to plant a rose every one foot in a rose garden. You're going to have nothing but problems down the road. So look at your options. Look at your heights. Look how bushy some varieties are, and you can kind of schedule out your garden accordingly. Um, I would never plant you know things in straight rows and a little box in a rows we're looking at stagger kind of that w pattern if you do a couple layers we can go tall we can go low and certainly mix roses in just about anywhere else in the landscape as well okay um, drainage is a good thing as we're raining today um, we don't want heavy clay we got to make sure the water's got somewhere to go roots got rose got a pretty extensive root system down the road so this isn't something i need a little one foot of good soil to grow a rose in. I need some couple of feet, you know, a good deep bed that drains well. If I dig a hole and I hit hard pan, I've got to break that out of there, get some compost in or something to help the drainage out, all right? Always at least, if you're buying most of the roses we sell are gonna be five gallon, a little 12 inch pot. If we go home and dig a hole, I'm looking at something again, about two feet by two feet to get me a good start. The bigger, the better that we can mix in some amendment in there and have and have uh, happy roses. Um, I would always, for me, I, you know what I mean about a moat, you know, if I put a plant in the ground, I've got a new rose shrub in, I'm gonna always leave a little circle of compost, kind of a moat or a donut around that. So when I'm out watering that first season or two, I can really saturate the area underneath that specific plant, in this case a rose, and not walk out there and bless them. We're not trying to bless our roses with overhead water. We want to fill the base, really soak them deep, and then we're going to have to water a little less often as well. Okay. Now you'll see a couple different amendments up here. Um, I would never complain or get mad at anybody for using compost. So we always have compost on special here. This month it's buy three, get one free, bags, bales. That's a great amendment for a rose. If you're going to mix that in with your native soil, we usually go about one-third amendment, two-thirds native. I dig a nice hole, have a little pile off to the side, throw some compost in there, mix that all up, and that's my backfill that I can mix up with my native, and then I've got a great start for the rose. 
We can also use a little compost as mulch. When I put my food down, that's what goes right over the top of it. Or when I plant a new one, we would get a couple inches of good compost there to uh, help again preserve water, get it a good start here for the first season. You'll see a second mix here if I pull up this purple bag. Can everyone kind of see that? So this is kind of the next generation of soils the last few years. I was always growing up with, we had potting soil, right? We put things in pots, we use potting soil, we put it in the ground, we get compost or, or amendment to dig. This is both. So if I'm gonna add a rose and I really wanna give it the best start, this has got things like alfalfa meal, specific ingredients in there for roses and flowering plants. I could use this in lieu of compost, or if you're like me and you're out of room in the garden, now we just keep buying more pots to put plants in. This is my rose potting soil. 100%. So if, so if 100%. I'm yeah, so if I'm gonna put a rose in a pot, I'm planting it straight in this. Does that make sense? Because I think a lot of people see compost. I can't plant in a pot of compost. It's not gonna grow. So I use potting soil. I'm not gonna complain about that, but if you really want to give your rose a great start, try that new bag out. That's a fabulous mix just specifically made for four roses. Okay. Now if we talk fertilizers, I've got a couple things up here. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm planting um, a new rose, I'm going to try, we do mostly organic foods here. I'll, I'll be honest with you, a couple things for annuals, but this is the way we want to go organic. We've got all the micronutrients, the hormones, the vitamins, all the things that are going to help our plant establish better. And the big difference is soil microbes. You're going to energize your soil by using a good organic food. So rose and flower food, easy. I use this on a lot of stuff in my own yard. My roses, obviously, but also perennials, some flowering shrubs some things uh, it'll it's not gonna hurt anything this is gonna help me a little more with bud and bloom and again it's got some alfalfa meal some other goodies in there as well so I'm gonna use about a half a cup of that when I put my rose in maybe I've got an established rose I'm gonna look at the chart and go, okay I've got a little bit taller one I'll use a cup or maybe it's two and we start to get on a regular feeding schedule with that here now about the first of March we're gonna have fabulous roses when we get through the summertime so EV Stone, the uh, rose food, alfalfa meal is one of those kind of wonder ingredients. Anyone use alfalfa meal right now? So that's something I couldn't speak enough of, especially on rose. That has all kinds of stuff the typical fertilizers don't. So when we're talking about especially older roses, trying to rejuvenate them, this is one of the best things you can put on your rose for new canes. You know, if I had an old tired rose that I can't seem to get more bud, <coughs> more growth off the canes. That's one that I can go ahead and add some alfalfa meal will help me for sure. So maybe not quite as much, but I would absolutely recommend using both of those again on our fertilizer schedule as we go through the season. The last one you'll see on there is Epsom salts. And this isn't the one we soak our feet in the bathtub. Anyone use Epsom salts in their garden? Mm -hmm. So that's a fabulous source again of magnesium, of, 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 of sulfur, different products in there. That's going to help with all those other things. If you want to really increase your bud count, especially Epsom salts is one of those great in, little magical ingredients to add to your fertilizer that's going to get you more bloom, more bloom. And with rose, that's why we want to grow them. We want to bloom, we want to get some fragrance. But I use that on hellebores, a lot of other stuff in my yard. We even have some customers now even on things like rhododendron. You know, we need, don't need a lot of it, but if I'm struggling to bloom on something, that would help me get some of this, a little more bud count that season, okay? So after we feed, we always want to water, water it in thoroughly. And this time of year, I would put all my magic ingredients down at the base and then mulch over the top with two, three inches of compost or the planting mix, whichever one you get. That'll lock all that down there again and kind of act as a little mulch here as we head towards the, the drier months here after 4th of July, right? So roses are heavy feeders. I mean, this is probably the number one thing we feed here at our nursery. You should be feeding them in your yard. A well-fed plant is always going to fight off disease. It's going to give you the flowers you want, and you're going to be happy with your rose. If you don't feed it, it is going to struggle. You need to feed roses point blank. This will be like our annual flowers, little for regular fertilizing schedule. We're going to have maximum flower power kind of thing. So get on a schedule about every six weeks with organics. We're gonna do the same thing, mix these things together, and then boom, I've got six weeks, and then another six weeks, and we go all the way through the summer, typically to early September, 
then we can shut it off for the year, let those roses harden off, and then we'll see you again come that next spring, okay? So get on a little schedule, you'll have much happier plants. We're never going to burn with organics. Do I have a measuring cup? Yes. Do I use it for my fertilizer? No. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, looks like a big handful, looks like a small handful. We're not going to burn anything by putting a little bit too much down. So I would always err on the, the heavier side than, than going a little bit lighter. Okay? So like I said right there, established roses, it's going to be probably more like a cup of rose food, half cup alfalfa meal, and if needed, a little bit more Epsom salts. We don't need a lot of that one of those couple tablespoon kind of things or a little sprinkle out of the box that usually comes more on a in a box form granulated like that okay now everyone knows when I say deadheading if you deadhead your roses above five leaves does everyone kind of know what that means be honest because that's a tough one in summer if I look down my canes I'm always looking for a leaflet of five leaves to the outside if I prune my spent flower down above that at an angle that's going to give me the quickest rejuvenation another shoot comes up another flower to enjoy on the second cycle okay if i cut it randomly off yes it will eventually bloom but i'm probably going to have to wait a little longer for that stock to develop so five the five number is always the key with roses as we start getting through may and our first blooms and then all summer long into fall okay I mentioned that real quick, but that's one thing I couldn't say enough of. No overhead watering. I mean, if you've got a sprinkler system, it is what it is. Try to run that thing in the morning so that it dries off when the sun comes up in the summer. If I water my rose, it's always at the base. It is not going to be walking out and wetting down the foliage. I'll speak for me, especially in the spring. I'm married to this place. I'm here a lot. I'm not home. When I get home, it's like, what do I got to water? What do I got to rescue tonight? Um, and that's a tough one for me because the yeah, evening is the worst time to water and we, if I, you're like me and we have to, we have to keep the leaves dry. If I'm a disease, I'm blowing around the wind and the rain. You know, you may do everything you can at your house, but your neighbor does not. So if she has black spot or he's got mildew or whoever, that's going to blow in the wind. And if you have wet leaves and I'm a spore and I land on there, now I've got disease. If it's dry, I won't. I mean, it's as simple as that. So we can't do anything about dew. You know, there's some things we can control, but to overhead water would be a big one with me. No sprinkler system, or if you do, it's in the morning. And if we water these things, try to always get them at the base. Now, this is a tough one for a lot of people, me included, because we walk out right now and we look at our roses and they probably have a bunch of fresh leaves on them, right? It looks like, oh, wow, it's already growing make sure that's fresh leaves and not old leaves because i would tell you you've got to strip them at one point in the summer or the winter and if you haven't i would probably sacrifice and get rid of those leaves the chances are that is where my black spot of mildew starts for the season you can't see it on there yet but once it warms up off we go for another year so you may be tempted by little leaves coming out the tips if we haven't pruned we need to do that as well but if we want to at some point let it start over again we get a mild winter sometimes mine are blooming at christmas still i think you probably are feeling the same thing uh, but we have to watch the weather and, and kind of plan accordingly so no leaves left from last year and i always have kind of two dates in my in my calendar president's weekend you know mid late february about now and then veterans weekend in the fall i always kind of try to get hip high in the fall and then towards knee high come springtime that's not climbing roses we're not chopping down our climbers that much because we waited years for them to get over the arbor but typical shrub roses if you can we're going to try to get them down a little lower to start with i always remove anything kind of less than a pencil thickness we don't really need all that little wispy growth on there we want the structure if you kind of think of my hand as a rose i want the center open and i want my canes coming out in that pattern. I don't want them going across. I don't want buds on the inside congesting the center. Again, sun, air circulation, uh, less disease is going to give me better roses. Okay? So wheat canes, dead wood, anything less than a pencil. I think that's an easy one to kind of tidy up. And then in the fall, I always try to remember this uh, at my pruning class in November, but I always remind people, hey, if you haven't done your roses, it's not that we want to cut them way back. But I worry about long canes getting broken in the winter with snow, other issues. So we get them down to a comfortable height like hip high. Then we can go back and address it in, in February to kick off the season again. Okay? 
Last thing on there is transplant. Who wants to move a rose? Anybody got to move a couple? That's always this time of year. We're like, you know, I could use that over there and I can go try a new one, right? So move it like now. You got about a week or two here to do this, but that's a dormant season only. You're going to get a pretty good deep root system on an old rose. The younger one's a little easier to move, of course. But try to get that done here, you know, again, Thanksgiving to about 1st of March. So you're getting towards your end. Uh, when things start waking up and growing, we'll have a little less luck. So move them if you're going to move them here next week or so. And then follow that exact same fertilizer schedule. You, if it was me, I'd go out and cut them back a little bit, tidy them up, do all the pruning, move it, feed it, mulch it, do all the goodies, and then off we go for, for a new home. Okay? Now the big thing with me is kind of, I don't know, does anyone know the words, I, the letters IPM? You know, if you're in the Master Gardeners or kind of in my business, that's a huge thing. We call integrated pest management. Now most customers, not to pick on anybody, but I'm, I've been doing this 30 years, and you will walk up and find me the second week of June and say, what am I going to do? My rose is covered with black spot and mildew. Okay, it's June. I don't know that there's a whole lot we're going to be able to do to get rid of it. We're going to have to cut it back, we're going to have to strip it, we're going to spray it, and we're going to probably deal with it the rest of the year. Is it the plague? Is it going to kill my plant? No, but you're going to be stuck with some crappy foliage, frankly, to, to be stuck with the rest of the season. If you come to me right now and say, I always walk out in June and I've got black spot and mildew, how do I keep it away? Now we can get some, some progress made. So the today hopefully is about thinking about down the road staying ahead of it a little bit using a much safer product and then not having to deal with the mess in the summertime you know i try to get stuff done a little earlier here we can protect our roses with some great sprays the options again are going to be up to you now i'll say a disclaimer here real quick because i'm an organic gardener and i don't want to offend anybody if you choose to use in your yard it's your yard you can do what you want to do but i'm a huge pollinator fan i think most people in gardening appreciate bees what they do for us um, the heavier chemical I use, the neo, the neonics, the systemics, you're point blank killing bees. So if you want to take it at that for what it's worth, maybe you hate bees and you're allergic and don't want them to sting, fine, sure you are, you know, kind of thing. So I'm not trying to get personal with anybody, but I'm going to show you your three choices. And I'm going to say this in addition, I think you're going to see the state legislature in the next year or two uh, tell you you can't use them anymore. It almost went through this year. I'm on the state board for a lot of things. <laughs> Um, and this is almost going to happen this season. I don't think they're going to pass it this year, but I bet you it's going to be after the next election. So yeah, they're going to still going to allow the commercial yeah, use, which doesn't. Make uh, sense. Well, <laughs> I don't know that that's going to happen quite as much either. But you're not going to be able to come to a store like Sunnyside. Your choice of products to take home is going to probably be cut in half. And it's, I, you would think it would make us mad for business, but frankly, I would smile because I'd rather not have that stuff on the shelf and not have people that don't read labels mainly. I take it home and use it the wrong way okay so I'm gonna move on from that so our three choices here are 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 this you know this is rose drench okay is it probably the easiest thing to do yes do I have to do it the least amount of times a year yes I'll be honest with you does this have neonics in it yes so if I apply this on a rose it's systemic it's going to travel through the entire plant and that includes the flower and the pollen and everything else so if I use this especially as we get in the growing season you know I'm going to leave the decision up to you but that's choice one I pour this down on the soil which I like better than spraying to be honest with you but this is one I could walk out here starting in March now and get my plant protected by doing this about every six weeks so I simply mix this in a watering jug, I pour it around the base of my rose, the rose absorbs it through the entire plant, and I almost have like a shield from inside out. Does that make sense? So it's not fertilizer. I would never go buy that garbage rose systemic in the, you know, that has food plus insecticide. Well, that's a waste of time. You're worried about disease to me more than bugs. This does everything, but it is not food. I want to make sure that's clear, okay? So there's my choice one. Choice two is something like rose shield in a spray. Now this is one I would mix in a sprayer, walk out, lightly wet down my leaves. I don't need to drench it. I don't have to fumigate it, but I wet it down. This is again systemic, soaks into the foliage and shields from inside out, but in a spray form. This will last about a month if I choose that route, okay? 
what I would try to try to talk you into is a neem oil. Who uses neem oil? So this is what we use here at the nursery. I'll be honest with you, a couple years ago I said I'm done with this stuff. I don't want to use it anymore here. Um, so this is what I use when I come in and spray. Yes, it sucks. I have to do it every two weeks, frankly, sometimes. But it's kind of the right thing to do these days. So Rose RX is cold pressed neem oil. This is the superior neem oil form. I'll raise it up so we can see it. And I'll show you a picture here in a minute. But this is one that I can apply every two weeks and never get the problem. If I have neem oil on something, it's one of those magical compounds man has found from the neem tree. We use it on our house plants. I can use it on anything, honestly, and it's totally safe. Now, I will say this before we move on from our three spray choices. You know, the bees are important to all of us for food and everything else in, the, in our area. They pollinate everything, for goodness sakes, or the vast majority of stuff we have in our yards. Um, I could use the safest thing in the world, and if I go out and spray the bee, you're going to kill the bee. So this isn't maybe about making the choice. You know, hey, I'm going to try neem oil like Trevor said. Let's see how it goes here, and I see if I can manage my issue. If I walk out at noon in, in June, and I spray my perennial garden and my rose with neem oil, you're going to get it on the bee, and you're going to kill it just the same. So this is morning, about right? choosing the right thing, A, if it's for your choice, and B, the timing. Get this done early in the day, late in the day when the bees are active. So there's an easy, easy answer for that as well, okay? I'm in here at 6 o'clock in the morning. If it's like, you know what, it's time to get the roses sprayed again, and I got... 2,000 of them. How'd you like to come spray my roses, right? <laughs> Takes a little while. So I come in here early, strap on the backpack with that exact same thing, and I will go along and wet everything down, and then I'm smells a little neemy for a while, and I'm happy. I smile, great. I got my neem oil down. I'm protected here for a little while, all right? So hopefully I didn't make anybody mad by talking about that. That's a tough one. So here's kind of pictures of the products. I got to swap out my box, but everything we try to get now in these little Ziploc soy ink pouches. I wish they were all organic, but we got to chuck the bag in the garbage. But it is soy ink, which is a great way to go. And I do like the resealable. I'm not going to buy a box of alfalfa meal and probably use the whole darn thing in a day. So where do I put it? You know, and it's dusty and messy. So the sealable pouches work great. So you've got alfalfa meal right there from E.B. Stone. We've got our E.B. Stone rose and flower foods, a great rose food. Um, you'll see the magnesium sulfate, which is what we call Epsom salts. Again, I'm not going to Bed Bath & Beyond and buying their Epsom salts. It's a little bit different. And then the last one there I didn't talk about, and again, now it's in a pouch, is Sulpo Mag. Um, I, it's certainly a great additive. Again, a different type fertilizer that has no nitrogen, no phosphorus. It's not about leaves and flower. That's about everything else. The root system, the overall health, the graft. Again, more canes as we get in older roses. So that may be something to try. I tell people, we don't sell a lot of it, but I tell people, I got a struggling rose, I'm gonna use all three of those. If I put the new one in, I'm gonna really focus on those two and see how it goes that way, okay? The last two you'll see are our amendments or bags. So again, that rose and flower is that hybrid soil where if I'm putting a rose in a pot, which is a great way to grow roses these days, I'm gonna use that in lieu of potting soil or use it digged into my soil mixed with my new planting or you'll see the compost there as well i would never be angry we use compost for anything we plant in the garden all right you'll see a little better picture of the products there if you couldn't see them the drench is the one i pour the rose shield is is got the systemic in it that i would spray and then we have our neem oil products right there so the brand new one now they've got the funny name on them, the Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew line. It sounds like murder, death, kill, but it's actually the, the, the neem oil, the natural line. So four in one with the cold press. Now I'm not kidding you, mites, disease, insect, all the above with one spray. I don't have to use something else. There's nothing wrong with using regular neem oil too. I always put that on there because they're very close and they do the same thing. So regular neem oil is fine as well. Now, let's do this. Is there any questions so far? Because that's a lot of information kind of on fertilizer spraying and all the above here. Yes? Uh, does the rain affect the spray? I mean, that, That's a great question. I should always say that. So if I'm going to spray anything, I don't need 24 hours of daylight. And you're going to see most every bottle will tell you on it, rain fast in an hour. Need four hours. Need two hours. I would say if you get up in the day... It could be overcast, I don't care about that, but like today, we're not going to spray. It's going to wash right off. If we have a typical springy 
cloudy gray day that doesn't rain. You just need a couple hours for it to dry on there very well. Yes. I would always do a little sun if you can, and wind is a huge thing. I'm not as worried about that with neem oil, but if I am going to go the chemical route, I want to make sure it is not windy. I do not want that blowing well on me, for one, my kid, my pet, my lawn, the shrub next door, because um, this is the kind of stuff, the chemical, we have to absolutely keep away from edibles. So I don't know where your roses are, but some folks have this and a strawberry and a blueberry and whatever. We got to make sure that's a separate, separate spray for sure. Yes. So the first slide talked about dig the hole twice as yep. wide and deep. Yep. So you mean twice as deep? Yeah. As I mean, small. I, I honestly, I think you're looking at probably digging a little two foot by two foot hole or so, okay. and even a little wider if you can. I mean, the but more the depth will be very deep. Yeah. And then you just need to make sure it doesn't sink. Exactly. Well, and then I've got my little backfill pile, so I'll mix my amendment there, and I will literally start filling it back in. And I'm not gonna get a compactor and turn it back into hard pan, but I'll step in there and yeah. make sure that it's right. nice and firm so that it doesn't settle too much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. I have roses in pots. Is it too late in the year to root prune them? Not at all. Same thing. It'd be like transplanting. If I've got roses in pots and they may need a little bit of root root pruning back in the same pot or transplant to a larger one, which is where I'm at here this month, um, then we want to do that here as well. I, if you're, as long as you're doing it on a spring day in the northwest, I do not think you're going to have to worry about soaking anything. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the only thing that I've had to deal with in my rose garden is um, aphids. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually just squish them with my squish fingers them. and yeah. wash them off, so I don't yep. really need any of those. Well, if you squish them, dish soap, neem oil, there's a lot of safe mm -hmm. stuff. That's why, again, I'm not trying to disrespect our, our sugar suckers in the world like aphids and other bugs. We could certainly get a problem with that as well. I'm way more on the disease side with the rose. Other plants, it would be the opposite with me, but I'm not as concerned about a few aphids. That's an easy thing to me to take care of and stay ahead of. The black spot, the mildew, the rust, those types of issues, not quite as easy. Yes. I've got a really old, like over 20 years before I moved to the house, mm -hmm. rose that I cut down to hip height or uh -huh. taller last year, tangled through it all. Um, if I'm putting all three of those on yep. it right now, about how much am I putting on couple couple cups? Plant? I would go two cups, it's one big. cup, and probably half a cup of that. Two cup, on one cup, plant. and half a cup. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's. That kind of segues into the next topic, so I appreciate you saying that. Um, <clears throat> so next, we'll kind of talk about some roses. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of some here. You know, our list is on our website. Our website has pictures of all of them. If you jump on there, fancy cell phone, you can scrap down and say, ooh, I like that one. I don't like this one. You can see them all. Um, I buy the roses here. I'm pretty specific about things I like, and disease resistance is a huge part of it. But I want to be perfectly clear disease resistant does not mean disease immune. Um, they're the best we can do, but if you look up, you know, just because it's resistant means I, I can't walk away and say, oh, it'll never get black spot and mildew. It probably will, you know, at some point here in Western Washington with the way that our weather is. There are some that are far better than others, but for us, speaking at Sunnyside, you know, we get all resistant roses. I just would be very hesitant to, to use the word immune. We're gonna give you the best chance it's up to you to supplement that with a little extra care to have a successful rose, okay? Now every year, part of this is our my evaluation and our staff here. So every year there's new roses. Um, I hate to tell you online, Jackson and Perkins does not exist anymore. I see them all over the place and everybody thinks they're buying an old Jackson Perkins rose like we used to 30 years ago. They've sold their land and quit growing roses like 25 years ago. So they buy from other growers put their name on it and say, oh look, you can have a Jackson and Perkin Rose again. There's nothing wrong with them, I just want to say that point blank, because there's really only two left in the U.S., and that would be Weeks Roses and Star Roses and Plants that really breed and develop new roses. David Austin, England, they do have an American headquarters down in Texas, we get a lot of Austin Roses, the same thing. <laughs> Those are really the three that are doing this. All the other places I find are borrowing roses from these other growers and selling great quality old-fashioned ones. There's nothing wrong with it, uh, but just I hear a lot. I get a lot of Jackson and Perkins questions at some. Where's all your Jackson and Perkins roses? Well, that just doesn't exist anymore. So that's another one. Now I test roses every year here. I just got a box in the mail last week.
for 2025. So I won't, you'll never see them, but most of the staff doesn't know they're here. I do. I don't spray them. I feed them, but I don't spray them because I want to see what happens if Mrs. Jones takes home that new rose and looks me in the eye and says, I promise I will spray it. <laughs> of course you won't. So when June comes around, how disappointed is she going to be? And that's a huge part of my evaluation is, you know what? That's a pretty good resilient rose. I didn't spray it. There's minimal issues with it. Yeah, that's a great color. It's got smell, whatever it is. Let's offer it to our customers next year. So don't think this is me looking on a magazine and going, ooh, that looks pretty. I think we should have that. <laughs> you know, we actually spend a little bit of time, and I did this all the way back to my White's days, where we test the new roses from Star and Weeks. They'll call me in the summer. What'd you think? How'd this do? Because they have to know in different regions of the country, totally different weather. And I get a lot of folks, we're happy to have you move up here from California to Southeast, wherever. Totally different roses we're going to grow in California than we're going to grow in Western Washington. Point blank truth. There's some people ask for, it's like, look, I'm not saying you can't, but you're going to struggle trying to grow Sterling Silver, you know, or Tropicana. There's a bunch of classic ones people still ask for that are just mildew black spot magnets up here, the opposite of resistant to me. We can find something with that similar color, let's do that instead. You know, it's just a lot easier to do, okay? A big thing here. Does anyone know when I mean budded or own root? Because that's a huge part of roses, I think, going forward. People that have brought up old roses, I can guarantee you, I look at that rose, I'm gonna see a big knob at the bottom, right? That's my graph where that rose was budded years and years and years ago. The problem with budded roses is all my canes are tired. How do I get new ones? And that's where some of this fertilizer will help. Some roses will not grow their own roots. You know, double delight. Mr. Lincoln, there's a lot of classic great roses that we can grow up here um, that will not develop their own root system. So if you want one, I have to buy a budded rose. It's not available on root. I buy everything I possibly can on root because if I don't have a bud and my rose gets killed back, what happens? It grows off the root system and here we come again. If a budded rose dies back, what happens? I get a, I'll get 20 phone calls in May. My rose is blooming red this year. What is going on? The whole top died, and now we got a garbage old Dr. Huey rootstock rose drawn that you need to dig up, throw in the compost bin, and go get a new rose. I mean, that's the honest truth. So rootstock is not what you pay for when they're budded. If it's own root, I've always got that backup of the root system. So think of hardiness. Over here, that doesn't matter quite as much. We don't get that cold to typically kill budded roses. It happens. There, I can tell years when we get cold enough, all of a sudden I'll come out here in March and be like, wow, 500 roses are gone already. Yeah, all the county got a little cold, everyone killed their budded roses, so they're coming down to buy new ones this year. Um, and it's not uh, great for business, but it's not necessary. It doesn't happen that often. Own root, I could have Eastern Washington, way up into Canada. There's some roses that grow all the way up in the Arctic Circle if I have own root system. Then I don't have to worry about that the graft is the weak point. The bud is where we would die in the wintertime. Okay? Now, that brings up the, exactly the second point, Mr. Tree Rose. Can you see one right here on the corner of the table? So we plant some tree roses now. I don't do a bunch. Um, I succumb to you, our customers, because we get, come on, why don't you carry a few tree roses? So we do, <coughs> but if I look at that plant carefully, what do I have? Two grafts. Not only do I have a graft on the root system at the base of the trunk, I also have the rose I want, in that case Double Delight, grafted onto the stem. <laughs> so what's going to happen in the wintertime? Do I even need to say it? i got to watch the weather because that's the rose to me that I'm going to take a much greater chance of having it die out in the cold in the wintertime than any other one. If I had tree roses in my house still, I would put them in pots, you know, then I can tuck it in if I need, if it gets cold, bring them back out, it's fine. Or I would leave it in the ground and protect those buds or grass. My mother used to whip out old pantyhose. I can find, you know, cloth. There's a lot of things you can use. You might have to put on some gloves and open it up a little bit, but I could sit there and weave something around those grass. I can mulch the bottom graft. I could take the top one and insulate it to protect it. You're probably okay, you know, doing it that way. But again, we get something into the low teens, single digits, God forbid, down there. 
that one you're going to have some problems um, again with the buds, especially the one that's out of the ground. Is that, is that making sense to everybody? Yeah. So rose trees are beautiful. They're great to throw in the landscape. I'm not knocking them. Uh, we do maybe 30 of them now. Maybe we'll keep getting more. Right? You know, I'm not sure yet, uh, but just something to keep in mind. You know, they're definitely the hardiness in the winter. Okay. Patio roses. We call that now instead of miniature rose. I still like miniature rose better. But now they have this fancy word, the patio rose, right? <laughs> so we do quite a bit of patio roses. Again, I listened to our customers here and the staff and said, you know, we should really start carrying some of these. Those are own root, which is great. So I've got the hardiness built in. But now I've got a small miniature rose. And I think a lot of people like roses, maybe don't have enough room to put a bunch of bigger shrub roses in. I like a little mini rose for some summer color. I got a pot in the sunshine. I think is a great place to do that. Plant a cool little mini rose out there and enjoy the blooms all summer long. Some have fragrance, some not as much, but I'm always going to have great color. And we do have a pretty good selection of those uh, back there as well for this year. Okay? So I think when this is all said and done, I put that down there and I'm hoping you'll be honest with yourself. You know, you need to make your own choice on how you want to do this. And you need to make your own choice on what you're going to do to that rose. So choose wisely for you, not for me. I can sit up here and preach about using this and that. It's up to you ultimately what you want to do in your own yard. But I would just say think about it and make the decisions for your own use. If you're not home and you don't have the time to get on a regular spray schedule, then maybe it's, we have to go towards that murder death kill or something a little, maybe a different plant sometimes. Uh, but you need to really think about that core because ultimately why I have the class here, why I hope you guys came, you obviously care about your yard. You're here listening to my boring rose talk, right? <laughs> but two, we want, to, we want to sell you a success. I mean, we're a retailer, we love to have sales, but ultimately we want you to have a rose with good food and learn how to take care of it so that you're gonna be happy and you're going, yes, I have a green thumb and not a black thumb, right? Because I hear that all the time. All right. So as we get into the specific types of roses here, and we'll whip through and just show you a few pictures. Now think of hybrid teas. Everyone kind of know the different types of roses we have to choose from. So just real quick, hybrid tea would be my long single stem rose. If I'm cutting roses, I go to the florist shop. Typically it's going to be a hybrid tea type rose. Double Delight, Mr. Link, we can name a zillion back there. By far the most popular rose. We carry a lot more hybrid teas than any other ones back there. All different colors in the rainbow, all different specific fragrances, but that's my long stem single rose at the top, okay? Grandiflora, we would, an exhibition rose always makes it seem like it's hard to grow because it's not. I would think this is hybrid tea with maybe three flowers at the top and maybe a little taller if I'm looking for a big tall rose at the background and then going down to something a little smaller in front, okay? So Grandiflora would be another choice. My favorite's Floribunda, that's just me. Um, I like the clusters of roses, I like the repeat flowering a little quicker, and I like the maybe a little lower, a little bushier habit. I'm not cutting roses to bring in my house. If I'm doing that, I'm buying one of those first two. If I'm just looking to have summer color, fragrance, whatever color I want out there, I'm going to look at some Floribundas. I think that's a great way to go for a nice, bushy, ever-blooming shrub rose, okay? We have climbers. You know, these are not climbing roses that are going to cling to anything, but if I attach it to an arbor, a structure, a post, you can have some beautiful climbing roses in the yard. Again, I'm trying to build structure so we're not pruning those as much as we would on our shrubs, but we're going to follow a couple of the same rules. Thin out all the wheat growth, less than a pencil, tidy it up every late winter right now, and then off we go again. But we're trying to cover something typically, so I'm not going to cut it back down to the hip every year and let it struggle to get to the top again each season, if that makes sense, okay? So lots of cool climbers. I think ground cover roses are a great choice for a lot of space filler. Again, I'm looking for color, flower power. Maybe I'm not going to walk out there and go, ooh, you smell delicious, but I look out my window, I'm like, wow, look at that. I've got flowers everywhere. Ground cover roses is a great way to go. Flower carpets, drift roses, um, these, this new Happy Trails. A series from Weeks Roses, all great choices Are those own root? for Space Eater. All own root, they're not grafted, so they're hardy. You're looking at something like less than three feet tall, maybe two, two and a half, that'll eat up some area side to side. And a lot of those honestly don't need the deadheading that you would find on a typical shrub. 
um, or a taller hybrid tea and those type of roses. I can almost just let them bloom, let them grow on top of that, bloom again, and just keep going all summer long, go in the winter, chop it back, and then off we go again for another season, okay? Austin roses is where we're gonna get a little English style going. We've got big, full, quartered flowers. This is where you're gonna read online and say, oh, that smells like pear with a, a hint of frankincense, you know, or, or myrrh, they get all these fancy words. <coughs> Dave, David Rose, David Austin roses smell incredible, point blank. I mean, if you're into old school, old garden perfume, the the worst smelling Austin rose is probably going to outdo the best smelling any other rose in the property in most all cases. So if I'm going for smell, I'm going towards David Austin. Um, he's got the look and the fragrance I think that most people are really enjoying. So lots of that out there too. Uh, shrub roses. You know, this is where I'm probably honest, you know, I'm an old dad, I'm in my almost mid 50s, I hate to say it, but I got a nine and 12 year old. So life flashed before me in the early 40s, like, wow, I'm not gonna have time to do some of this like I have for the last 20 years on my own. I got kids to worry about. So I went from Hybrid Tees and Grandiflores and all that. I'll go back to that someday when they're out the house, right? <clears throat> but I want to shrub roses. I want the color, I want the smell. Um, Cause there is no better blooming plant that's gonna bloom the entire summer to fall than a rose. I mean, that's just the point blank truth. So I went to shrubs, own root shrubs, things I can maintain. I don't have to spray as much. Maybe don't even have to feed as much to be honest with you. So I still have the color I want here and there in my yard, but I've just swapped styles of rose. And then when my 18 year sentence is over, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Around the house. And I'd go back, oh sweet, I'd go back to my sun spray, my pumpkin patch, and all the ones that I like, you know, to grow, okay? We mentioned tree roses a little bit real quick, and then again the patio. Those are kind of your, your options here. Um, I will add to that on the shrub rose, anyone know Ragosa? Okay, who lives in Everett? You got a few people, I live in Everett, so nobody else lives in Everett, I'm alone today. <laughs> but a lot of cities use these, and Everett does very well with them. If I drive down the waterfront down there in Everett, I've seen the lawnmower going along and pruning them. That's how easy they are. So Ragosa Rose is the one type of rose that I would get heavy, heavy fragrance. If I spray it, I will damage it, so we never spray Ragosas for bugs, perhaps little bit of aphid here and there but that is disease immune I will use that word on those immune okay no black spot no mildew but really thorny canes they sucker and spread a little bit so it's up to you and your yard but that's a great rose to choose if you want the flower power the added interest of probably the rose hips as we go into fall and winter and something I really don't have to be very careful with as far as pruning and feeding and all the rest of that stuff as so well too. So you don't have to feed those as much? I would feed them, it's not that. I'm not gonna say no food, but I'm not gonna be probably as particular as I am with my Double Delight, my Mr. Lincoln and all my fancy schmancy roses. Those I'm gonna throw out there in the sun. Do your thing, you know, create me a perimeter, make me a bank. I have had, I've had Ragosas in Cleelm at a place I had that grew like a wall. The elk came, pruned them for me every winter. Sweet, thank you. <laughs> Up we come again. These are own root, they're indestructible. You know, probably not the one I'm gonna put right by the front door, you know, to be brutally honest, but if I've got a sunny area in the garden, I'm like, you know what? I would just like to see flower power all through there. Throw some in, they'll send up new canes and establish and naturalize. You'll have a beautiful, a beautiful bank of roses doing Ragosa, okay? So be honest with yourself, will you spray? You know, it's always the question, will you deadhead? You know, again, the shrub roses I don't have to worry about as much, the other ones I do. Do I want to cut flower or fragrance? These are the questions I'm hoping your brain's going, yes, he's asking me my right questions. Um, do I just want summer color, which is ultimately what I want, I want flower power all summer, then I can make my choice, okay, because now I can find that rose again. There's no better shrub that's going to bloom the entire summer than a rose, point blank. Everything else has got six weeks or a month or six weeks. That's something that keeps going the entire summer, okay? So real quick, I'll show you a few. We've got a lot of them out there, so don't think these are the only ones that I like. I have a tough time cutting this down to a manageable number. We're gonna go fast because we're already at 45 minutes and I have probably 50 of them on here. So there's quite a few to choose from. Again, Hybrid Teas, Perfume Factory, you can probably guess by the name. Really good smell on that one. 
it's kind of a fun color too, a little bit different than some of the others. <coughs> Just Joey is still by far the best apricot be colored rose you could ever grow in Western Washington. The rest of the hybrid teas like that are going to be a little more disease prone. Just Joey's the way to go if you like those colors. We've got a great one like Pretty Lady. That's part of the Downton Abbey series from Weeks. So a lot of good classic rose. Great smell on most of that series as well. Um, lots of things with love in it. Imagine that. You know, we have love and love at first sight and love me this and love me that. There's a whole bunch of love out there if you go look through the roses. So love at first sight, it's got the good red, but I also add that second color, which I think is a real trait of a lot of modern roses. They're going for that, what I used to call South American rose look that we couldn't grow up here. Now we can. You know, we've got some good options for some fun colors. Painted porcelain is really cool if you like pinks almost like a silver pink. That picture doesn't do it justice, but that's a really good silvery pink color. Um, that's a newer one. Lots of good pure reds out there. Um, I still buy probably more Mr. Lincoln than anybody who's got Mr. Lincoln in their yard. That's always a classic. Great smell on Mr. Lincoln. That's a big tall one too. Um, and there's nothing wrong with old A, but if I was gonna go like, you know what? I could live with a little less smell. I like my red, but I want it a little less disease. I'm going to probably get one like Veterans Honor. That's a much better rose um, against black spot mildew for sure than, than Old Age Lincoln. Henry Fonda, I think, still the best yellow, uh, pure yellow hybrid tea that's been around for a long time. That's a great one. And white has made a comeback. A lot of people like white. Uh, Sugar Moon might be one of the best roses on the entire property if you like white. That is as good as I've seen for disease resistance and the smell is outstanding. So that to me checks every single box. If you like white, that is by far the best white hybrid tea out there for sure. Uh, Francis Meelan, the Meelan family um, has done little star roses back in the day. They've got quite a bit of roses mixed in their catalog. That's a great pink. We carry Papa Meelan too. That's a big old red one. But these are gonna be noted for the heavy smell. Big flowers, lots of fragrance. That would be another, another choice. And I like good as gold, a little bit different. It's not quite yellow, it's not really orange. It is kind of gold color in the middle. It's right in the middle of those two. Um, and that's been another popular choice um, from a lot of our customers back there. Uh, Grandiflora again is our tall one. So we've got some, we don't do quite as many of these, but we do have a pretty good selection back there. Um, the most popular rose on the entire property is Twilight Zone. I'll tell you right now, if you want that dark purple, uh, get it today or in the next week because I'll be sold out and that's something I can't get again until next January. So uh, we got 50. I bet you half of them might be already gone. We haven't had a class yet. But if you like purple, that's the one we carry that is deep dark purple and it smells incredible. So that would be the way to go for a dark purple one. Uh, pop art's kind of funky. If you look at that flower, some people like their, their variegated roses or multicolored roses. That would be kind of a unique one. Um, it's got a lot of pinks and yellows and different colors going in those big old flowers. Same with Parade Day. You can see the variegated flower there. I'd have pink, but I'd have a regular kind of white striping mixed in with it as well. That's kind of a fun one. And I'm sorry, I call that the Sandra Bullock Rose. I'll probably get sued for calling that, but Miss Congeniality. Um, that was one of the first ones I saw a number of years ago that came out with that beautiful painted edge. So that's another, again, to me, it goes back to that florist rose. Well, you can't grow that here. Yes, you can. There's some really fun kind of painted edge type roses you'll see out there now like Miss Congeniality. I had to put the queen in there, RIP. She's got one of the original Grand of Flores. Goes back a long time, but there's no, certainly nothing wrong with Queen Elizabeth. That's been a great rose for a lot of years. And then Anna's Promise would be part of that BBC series, again, the Downton Abbey series. Give me a little bit of that coppery kind of orange. That's a little different color again than we see on a lot of a lot of typical roses out there. Now, if you ask me, both Weeks and Star are getting into the imitation game with uh, Mr. David Austin. They've obviously seen how popular his roses are. So more and more, especially their Grand Flores, come out with that absolute English kind of quartered look, like the English roses with the heavy smells. So you'll see a lot of Grand Flores back there, like. That kind of looks like an Austin rose I just saw in the other row. Um, but there would certainly be options, maybe a little taller growing ones, um, if you like that heavy smell and that, that English rose look. 
State of Grace is a great one. Happy Go Lucky is another one. We got quite a few on uh, all different colors back there. These are my Floribunda, so I brought a few up here on the table, but these are obviously not blooming quite yet. They still look like they're getting ready for spring. Um, you'll see a lot of good Floribundas, and I can pretty much do all the colors in the rainbow with those. Um, I think a lot of blues and lavenderish colored ones lately have come out that have been good. That's another color that was probably a little tough. So Arctic Blue, we've got Orange, like Burst of Joy. Uh, Celestial Night's fabulous if you like kind of that plum color. That's another great smell to that one. Ketchup and Mustard, everyone buys early. That's not my thing, but I don't like condiments anyway, so ketchup and mustard is probably not for me. Um, that's another example, again, of those two colors blended into one. I mean, it is a pretty striking flower. If you like ketchup and mustard, you might want one of those. Uh, Easy Spirit by far is the best white, and it's the only white floor bundle we carry anymore because, again, superior disease resistance, great smell, really easy to grow. Um, you'll see that Easy Spirit, Julia Childs is another one in that group. Um, you'll see this, they call it the Easy Elegance Collection back there from Weeks. You know, if you were a beginning rose gardener, you didn't want to necessarily cut them perhaps, but you wanted the color like I talk about. Um, I would look a lot at those easy, easy roses back there. There's a lot in that series and they are very easy to grow. Great blooms, nice smell on a lot of them, but very disease resistant. Not quite immune, but I would say definitely a step up above typical resistant ones, okay? Height if, on the floribundas? What's that? Height. It's going to depend a little bit on which one, but you're always going to be maybe a little lower, typically four feet on a big and a little bushier habit, not quite as upright as the other types. Um, the one right there I put on, Julia Child, so A, that's a great rose, but that might be the, the if, if just throw out the shrub roses and the rugosas for a minute, that's probably the most indestructible rose on our property. Everybody who's bought those and listened to me over the years has come back and said, really enjoyed the Julia Child. Great smell, own root, very disease resistant. That's one I would say you might be able to walk away from the spray on if we had it in full sun. If you like that color, that may be a great choice for you as well. That was the original member of that Easy to Love series from Weeks. That's a great rose. Life of the Party, we finally got kind of that old peace rose look on a Floribunda, the pinks and the yellows. A Love Song, I try a lot of lavender ones. That's a color we get asked for quite a bit here. A lot of them, frankly, in Washington are garbage. This side of the mountains, they just are horrible for disease. This one is not. I've gotten rid of Angel Face and a bunch of other ones over the years. Love Song has performed very well here. If you like lavender, great smell. That's an excellent choice for that color. If you want to go a little tie-dye psychedelic, we can go with Frida Kahlo. That's a great color, kind of a fun rose to grow. And then we all got to flex out for Rosie the Riveter, right? So Rosie, I like orange as my color, so that's another one of my favorite roses back there. We get an awful lot of Rosie the Riveter, and that would be another one in that easy to love series. Very easy rose to grow. I still get old Sunsprite. I don't know why it's not the best one for disease up here, but it's always the first one to bloom. It's a great yellow, and it is a fabulous fragrance. So. Um, I could walk out there for 30 straight years I've been doing this and the first flower I get rose on every single year is Sunsprite. So if you want a little earlier bloom, um, I will have to spray that a little bit, but we do get quite a bit of Sunsprite in because I think that's a, still a great yellow after all these years. Then Pumpkin Patch, my orange again, I always got to put an orange one on there. Uh, climbers, we get quite a bit of climbers again trying to listen to you guys. I don't know how many years in a row, but that's been the first roses that sell out here. Everybody's doing climbing roses these days, going vertical. Um, so lots of climbers back there right now to choose from. Fourth of July, you can see Joseph's coat. The number one rose in the entire world is Eden. We carry white Eden, pink Eden, pretty and pink Eden. I get all the Edens I can in. So we've got a lot of those back there. Um, and then we can go old, old school and go Don Juan, right? Uh, that's a great fragrant red climber a um, little bit little bit old school on that even purple splash golden opportunities a little bit of a new one um, maybe kind of an orangey yellow kind of again that different color that a lot of those roses are not we've got some patios there's just a couple of those mini options like life's little platters all a twitter 
course, we have to we have to change the name of that one now. I'm curious. Is it like all? Is it all an X? Isn't that what they're calling it? So we'll, we'll call it all an X, right? That sounds fun. Uh, here's your rugosas. So again, straight rugosa species is gonna. They call it red rugosa, but it's really more of a dark pink flower. And then we have white. We get a lot of those in here. I'm looking for indestructible, except for the deer. We'll prune them for you. And then we have a lot of hybrid rugosas, which I think a lot of our customers gravitate towards. So a little lower and spreading. This is what I would find down on the waterfront in Everett. And then a lot of gardens that are looking to eat up some room but not get quite as tall. So snow pavement, pink pavement, a purple pavement. We got all those back there. We got Hansa. If I want to go red, we go Linda Campbell. Has every color back there, even pure whites. Um, you can find on a lot of those hybrid rugosas. Right now you've got maximum selection. So ground covers, here's our happy trails. We got sunshine, we got rainbow. I like the playful, I think that's a great flower on that one. And then if you want kind of a little more orangey coral pink mix, that sunset one's a great, great variety as well. We got four choices on the ground cover roses in the happy trails series. And then drift, we carry a few colors. Um, this is something I could probably order for you if you wanted a different color we don't carry But I try to get lemon and drift. I got a pink. I got a red. We got a few back there But as we get in the spring a lot of these my growers grow as well And I'm able to supplement with a little extra inventory where we planted all our own bare roots And we can control the soil the food the pruning and all that stuff here in January Now we've got some Austin. So now we get into the big English style um, I think Olivia Rose Austin has always been at the top of my list for his roses. Um, he names it after his <coughs> granddaughter. You probably think it's a pretty special one when it comes to rose. So that's one. Uh, Darcy Brussel. Uh, I like my yellow and orange, so there's a couple of my favorite ones. Uh, excuse me. Windermere. No, not the realtor, but somewhere in England, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Golden Celebration is a great classic one. The brand new ones for us this year, because I'm trying to get as many Austin's as I can. They're, they're tough to get uh, wholesale a lot of times. Uh, we get as many as we can, but the few that new for us this year, uh, I think Bring Me Sunshine is outstanding. That's a really good color, great smell. We've got those back there. Eustacia Vi is another new one for 2024. And then these are new for us. So some ones that I've got in here, they may have been out for a few years, but we've decided to add to our inventory. I've got a couple of classic rose lovers on staff here that say we need more single roses. So I've got Kew Garden and a few of the other single type old classic roses back there. Night, Night Bevan is very new. Port Sunlight, that's very new as well. And then there's a great picture of a climber. Like that's Lady of the Lake. But you'll see on our David Austin's back there, look at the, they got huge picture tags, which is great for customers to see all the information. But look on there, is it shrub or is it a rambler climber? I don't buy any roses from him or anybody that bloom once and they're done because that was the case with some old roses back in the day. So all these will repeat if I deadhead through the summer, but maybe I want something that'll climb up a little post and add some height into the garden. Maybe I buy a rambler. You can grow it in an obelisk, you know, or a post, or it doesn't have to be necessarily a trellis or an arbor, but I can add a little bit of different element by trying some of those. I will tell you, if you want my opinion, pretty much any of his roses as shrubs, if I don't prune them, I can probably turn them into a small little climber or rambler. I mean, that's the honest truth. So I think I can turn a lot of those into a little taller plant by just not pruning them back quite as far, okay? The brand new for us for 2024 besides the Austins. So Cosmic Clouds, I think it's the best rose of the year. You know, again, I'm a shrub rose lover. I like own root. I want disease resistance. I like fragrance. That is A, a great color. It's that plummy purple with the cream underneath. It's got great heavy smell to it, um, but that is a own root shrub rose. So I'm gonna have bouquets of flowers, very disease resistant the entire year. I think that's a great choice. Uh, especially if you're not going to want to spray quite as much. Same exact story with Pink Freedom. You can look at that and see kind of a little bit of Ragosa look to that rose. Um, in the landscape, great smell, absolute flower power, 
but maximum disease resistance again and bone root. Anybody do knockout roses? You got a couple knockout roses in here. So kind of more of a southeast thing. It's a good Pacific Northwest rose as well, but these would all be shrub roses on root. We can get a lot of different colors. I got a bunch this year. They're very good resistance against mildew. Maybe not quite as much on the black spot end. If we spray them, we'll keep them clean just like any other rose. Um, but I'm looking for flower power. Probably not as much deadheading again, but I just want color and I don't maybe need quite as much fragrance. That might be a great own root a kind of shrub rose to choose from. There's pinks, there's reds, there's doubles, there's singles, there's quite a few. They call it in the knockout family from Star Roses. The two brand new ones are absolutely nothing like them so far. That Easy Beezy actually has a little bit of smell and it's a great yellow. And then there's my color again. I got an orange one finally they haven't had. So orange glow will give me again a light fragrance but great disease resistance on a little shrub rose. The new drift this year is buttercream, so kind of halfway in between. They had one called popcorn, looks like slightly buttered popcorn, and then we had our lemon. Now we kind of got a half color right in between, if you like that, that kind of creamy yellow, a little bit different. And then power puff, or we call it power puff pink, that's a new Florabunda from Star. And again, what am I looking at? That flower looks an awful lot like a David Austin rose. You can see their breeders are going for that English rose look, and again, that the heavier fragrance as well. A couple from weeks here, Make Me Blush. You know, it's got the pink with the yellow in there. That's kind of a different color. We haven't really had that choice um, in a good hybrid tea rose um, thus far. And then again, right back to the Austin look. What does that Grand Flora look like? A lot of the David Austin English roses. Miss Manners, that's a great name. And then I think probably the, the most unique one that came out this year uh, would be this Quest for Zest. That's a great name. Uh, this smells like fruity lemon. It's a great smell. It's a little bit different. Um, I know the readers at Weeks went for lemongrass and kind of really tried to work that fragrance into a lot of their new roses uh, going forward. So it smells a little different. I think it's a great fragrance. We had that as a test last year. Everybody loved it that smelt it back there. But it's a little different color. It's not yellow. It's not white. It's again right in between it's almost like you got a yellow center and you took kind of that creamy color and painted the outer petals with it so a little bit different for a nice new tall grandiflora okay so that's a lot of roses you can always like i mentioned our website rose list picture information on there you've got a lot of resources on our own website and certainly the internet you're more than welcome you as homeowners can jump on the star roses site um, as well as the week site, but be careful if you go in the rabbit hole, you may not come out for about four or five hours. There's a lot of stuff to look at on both those. Um, just keep in mind, you know, I carry a lot of roses. We don't carry all of them, obviously. There's no way we would have an entire nursery filled with roses. Um, there's some other great nurseries around that do stock uh, roses we don't carry that I might send you up to Christensen's or somewhere else close that maybe has a little more roses as part of their palette. But do me a favor and think of two things. I mean, look at disease resistance and look at the petal count. That's a huge part of roses in our specific climate. The higher the petal count, the more chance of my roses going brown in this weather we're having today. So in the summer, probably not, but I've had a lot of people call like, man, my flowers look like they're gonna open and they were just brown. The more petals I have, the more area of moisture and the rain are gonna seep in and the more chance I have for not maybe flowers that are, are quite as showy as I would on a, on a simpler rose, okay? <clears throat> you can always email us, and there's our website address right there. Now, before I kick you guys out of here, we'll do some questions if you need here in a second. Just keep in mind, today is a great day to plant this time of year. It's a little rainy, we got some umbrellas, you can brave the weather for a minute. But all this stuff is on sale from the class today, and you got today through Friday to shop, and then the discount's over. So all the roses, 20% off, no exclusions, whatever. You can buy whatever rose you want back there. You tell them I was out Trevor's boring class, I hit a button on the register, and you got 20%. I also had them do all of this as well, which I don't do some years. So if I want the good rose soil, 20% off. Get the fertilizer today, because that's a great price. Organic food is not cheap but it is far superior to anything else you're gonna find 
I think E.B. Stone's at the top of the totem pole for quality. Get your food, and it might not be just for the roads. I took three bags of that home the other day in my truck because I'm like, ooh, time to do the roses and get all my perennials and hellebores and everything else that's in the yard. That's a great flower food for all blooming plants. So that's on special, alfalfa's on special, Sopo Mag's on special, Epsom salt, and then all the different sprays as well. So if you want to stock up on your neem oil, neem oil or get your other choices there for rose treatment, you got 20% on all that today as well, okay? So yes. it's not too early to prune. No. Not at all. I would go. We don't have to worry for the forsythia blooming first. No, I mean again, I always stick by that presidents weekend okay. in November. I'm gonna get you down to a comfortable height for no break. Let it go for the winter, and then presidents weekend was a week ago. Anytime now to early March. It's not like you missed the boat. Don't don't think you can't do it now. But sometime here in that late February time frame is perfect. Um, if I saw the weather this week, I'll be honest with you. They're saying it might snow. It's not going to be very cold if it does. If it was going to be 12 degrees, I would tell you to put the pruners back in the holster and walk away for a week because we don't want to prune when it's that cold on anything. But I don't care about 31, 30, 29, you know, probably down to 25 or so. It's going to be right back to 45 degrees two days later. So I would not hesitate with this little, they said wintry weather, when, when, you know, Sunday and Monday. It's like, well, I remember the nine degrees in December. That's wintry weather to me. But this will be this will be fine. It's not going to affect any plants at all. I would have to walk out there with nice blankets and wrap 2,000 roses if I was that worried about it. And I'm not going to. So there you go. All right. We got some more questions. Yes. I've got an area in my rose garden that I need to firm up. Okay. Would you suggest adding that rose and flower? Well, I don't know how large of an area, and we all have pocketbooks, so I'm not going to tell you to buy 50 bags of that, you know, and build up a 50-foot bed. No. But what I would do is look for a really good base mix, like a three-way planting mix, some sand, some compost, some topsoil, to build it up, and then absolutely add this into my planting holes, and then off we go. Yeah. Yes? So you mentioned the danger of the tree road, yeah. the two graph sites. Yeah. So if you Yes, you can, but just winter. but just make sure in the spring we pull, pull which is honestly what I used to do. She asked a great question about the graft of the base. You know, I can mulch it, I can straw it, I can do all kinds of stuff to help protect it a little bit. But that's what I did was compost in the winter. winter then in the spring, okay. I could pull the pull compost away. away, add my fertilizer, and then boom, that compost becomes my mulch instantly. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So yes. the graft's supposed to be basically what you're seeing. These are planted at slightly above the right ground. Right above the ground right if you can. I'm not going to, it's not the end of the world. You can I see a lot of them get away with burying them down a little bit, but I, I wouldn't leave a stalk in the ground for sure. I want that right at ground level. We can always kind of feather our mulch out a little bit and not bury that graph in the growing season. And honestly, now I got a nice basin to collect the water I put on it as well. Yeah. Yes? First, first um, spray and first yeah. spray. If you've got, you know, if you haven't, let, let, let's do this. If we haven't pruned yet, I would not waste your time spraying until you prune. Right. So I walk out and I tidy up from my spring. I'm immediately probably, if I have any leaves coming out, I'm immediately getting my first spray. And I'm getting on that cycle, whichever way I choose, I'm going to get on that cycle immediately. I don't know that, again, you're going to run home with the neem oil and get it today. It's probably going to be mid-March, I'm guessing, you know, about two, three weeks down the road. And we would get on that cycle going forward from there. And then fertilizer? Same thing. I put that down now okay. because organics never water soluble. They don't go away. You've always got it there. So I put that down right as that's waking up. It's got everything it needs to get a good start. Scratch it in. Yep. Okay. Scratch it in or mulch over it either way. I think Mother Nature is going to wash it in for you so you don't have to water it in. <laughs> yes. And then are the David Austins notably less disease resistant than some of the others you mentioned? You know, I, I don't know that I'd go quite that far. <coughs> I think there's some of both, honestly, with, with them. I would say this, in my experience and here and growing them at my own house, um, I would probably have more of an issue with the mildew side of it than I would the black spot side of it. Um, mildew to me is a lot easier to correct. If I do get it, I can prune it back and I can feed it, spray it, and then we got clean growth comes out. 
Black spot's a little tougher when we get it on the interior because nobody wants to strip their plant down in June, cut it back, and honestly let it start over again, which is sometimes what we would have to do. Um, there's some definitely that are better than others. Again, all of the ones we carry, because there's others I would get that I know are not nearly as good, <laughs> to be honest. They're all going to classify as resistant on, on the ones we get from him, um, but I would look I would look up here more with the mildew starting versus down the middle looking for the black spot. Yeah, yeah a little bit more mildew prone. Yes? What do you mean by blind shoots? Oh, blind shoots on there. I didn't mention that. So that's a really tough one to explain, but I'm extremely OCD, I hate to admit, in my garden and here, you can probably tell sometimes. Um, I will go back there personally because I can't seem to get my staff to do it right. But the cooler and the wetter the weather is in spring, your rose is going to grow. you got beautiful leaves. Man, that thing looks gorgeous. Where's all my flower buds? So if we're cold in April, especially mid-March through April, it'll grow and look like it wants to bloom. But I have no buds at the tips of my stems that come up. Does that make sense to everybody? So if I see that, a lot of times in cold weather, they will fork give you beautiful leaves and I will never get a flower bud there. So what I do is go through and look at everything, snip, snip, snip. It's not a huge job, but I will look for those points, cut that stem down to five leaves, now I'll get a bud up instantly, okay? So if I walk out, uh, I'm not saying everybody gets it, it doesn't happen every year. I do it here because I'm a retailer and I want as much flowers as I can. Um, and in my yard the same way, I would look at it and you get to mid-May you're like, God, this looks great, you know, healthy. Where's all my flower buds? You should see them by then. And if you don't, I'd look real close from the top and go, oh, yeah, I see what he means. We've got forks. I'll tell you what I'm going to do because I've never done it is I already wrote a note on my phone to remind me when I'm back there pruning blind shoots this year, I'm taking some pictures. And that'll be on here for next year because it's really hard to, <coughs> to verbally explain it. But if you think of that stem, you know, everybody knows a rose. I get the stem comes up, it goes up, it's up. I get a flower bud, it opens, I cut it down to five, here comes another one. You're going to see that same thing come up, it's just going to have two leaves at the top and just sit there and do nothing. It'll be green, it's making chlorophyll, all the rest of it, you know, it's nothing that's not dying, but I'm not going to get a bud until I go down, cut it off above five, and now we, now we shoot up again. Yes. Yes. Um, containers. Uh, if you've got a container that's large, that's uh -huh. like two feet tall by two feet yep. wide at the top, is that big enough to put like a Florabunda in? I mean, that would get you. I was going to say with the rows, we're not going to do this. We want that. You want a big We pot, got a big root system. But you don't have to stick with the miniatures. So no, I think can... two by two, you could have really any rows in there for a lot okay. of years. You know, at some point, she asked me earlier about, about I got to pull it out, root prune it, which is fine. It's not going to be forever. But I would guess you, if you got one of those in a two foot pot, you're going to be happy for probably seven, eight years okay. before I got to worry about going bigger or transplanting it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yes? Um, I was just going to say that, you know, I've gotten s uh, some of my own brew roses from Heirloom. Yep. Roses yep. In yep. Portland. Yep. You can still get like Mr. Lincoln and they have Double Delight. I bought two of those. They're Did they big. grow okay? Yeah, they're terrific. Interesting. They're, really they're not cheap. And sometimes you have to wait until. Um, you know, another <coughs> batch for the next year because they, they grow they sell so out. Yeah. But um, they, they do an amazing job. Like, I, I'll check it out a little more because yeah. I knew him and there's another old guy down there, Fred Edmonds is another place down in Oregon that kind of played with their own rootstocks and I was curious if anybody got them to take because that was the issue was lack of vigor. Man, I got, you know, I, I got It grew just as well as a budded. All right, that's a yeah, great tip. Really yeah, because them, you know, and again, you're at Sunnyside. I hope you, you support us too. But there's some great I have plenty of nurseries I around. Exactly, Chris. <laughs> you, know, you know, I mentioned John. John Christensen is a great friend of ours here. We've known we know our families have known each other for 30 plus years. There's nothing wrong with Christensen Nursery. He probably stocks too many roses, if that's possible. To be honest with you, uh, but he gets everything he possibly can. Then he leaves it up to you to figure it. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, we well, can grow all this, but. A lot of that stuff you're really going to have to spray pretty hard to keep it clean. Um, there's a, you know, and the other one is the old, uh, is it still Cottage? There's an old rose nursery and out in Snohomish too. Oh, yeah. The antique, Rose Farm. Old antique, rose, antique rose, rose Farm. farm. Yeah, yeah, that's, again, I, I've been out there many times. I've talked to them all the time. They would have some different things as well to try. Yeah. 
I'm yeah. just going to add that I also got a couple of Jet Airline Okay. And they've done well. Done well. Okay. I'm going to check them out because that may be a place, you know, that I can go visit when I'm down touring this summer and see how they've got to take because that has been the issue with, with production rose growing bare root is they just lack the vigor that the budded one does. So I'll be curious what they put on them. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, well, thanks for coming down. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of staff out. If you, We've got umbrellas in there if you want to <laughs> do some shopping. But like I mentioned, you've got the whole week through Friday. So if you want to take advantage of the discount, yeah, you can get a little, save quite a bit of money and do, do some fine, okay? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, don't worry.